Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connection. Today, we're going to talk about the asymmetric new creative models of war we have been learning about only in the last couple of years. Uh, we're going to talk about Israel and Ukraine. We're going to talk about how they are examples of new creative models of war. Hmm. With Rupmati Kandakar, who, who I have missed and who is back after the new year. Happy New Year, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay, and a very, very happy new year to you. And I missed you all too much. <laughs> so let's go, Jay. <laughs> a good year to begin with now. So, Rupati, you know, um, with technology, with what I want to I want to say creative thinking, although creative may not be the best word for it, um, we have seen many new techniques, asymmetric techniques for war. And we saw that with uh, Putin, the way he uh, handled the uh, hacking and uh, the way he handled propaganda and so forth um, before and at the inception of his invasion of Ukraine. And the way that war is going, there's so many things that have never happened before um, in that war. Likewise, uh, in, in Israel and Hamas, we have learned so much about some draconian, dastardly things um, that can be done. I compare it in my own mind to um, the redcoats and the revolutionaries, it seems appropriate these days, um, in the, what, 18th century in the United States, uh, where they stood on a hill in their red coats, and the citizens watched them. The citizens were safe while they shot each other with their long rifles. So, oh, that's different now. Seems like wars these days are addressed at the citizens. Um, and, the, and the military is uh, are, uh, tasked with trying to protect the citizens. It's so interesting. Anyway, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how it's changed, what we have learned from Putin, what we have learned from the Israel-Hamas war right now going on. So let's talk, I'll, I'll identify some of the issues I think are appropriate, but uh, you can add any ones you want. For example, uh, IEDs, you know, you see all these um, clips of uh, the Israeli tanks moving around Gaza. And they're always moving, um, you know, on, on rubble. They're moving in, in plowed dirt. They're not moving on roads. Why is yeah. that? It's because there are, there are explosive devices and mines on the roads. So they have to go out, outside the roads. This is new. Uh, and mines, mines in Ukraine, uh, mines everywhere, uh, making very difficult for the Ukrainians to gain territory. And then, of course, uh, why not knock off agriculture in a good part of the country um, by exploding the Kokovka Dam um, and making, you know, uh, stopping the flow of agriculture to uh, Central Africa uh, and um, making it very hard for the Ukrainians to conduct any kind of commerce or agricultural commerce in uh, Ukraine. So all of these are like no holds barred. We have wars now that are no holds barred. You want to comment on it? True, Jay, it's now totally asymmetrical is the right word because conventional was thrown out of the window when we saw uh, Israel uh, deal with the Hamas terror attack and uh, Russia, you know, it's all but annexed Ukraine, isn't it, Jay? And uh, uh, they are not uh, apologetic about it. Israel acted in self-defense. They are not apologetic about it. Putin has acted in self-pleasing um, uh, uh, manner and he's not apologetic about it. So, and nobody's accountable to the international organizations in the world. So that is a new uh, dimension that they have got in. But these, uh, uh, you know, you see the IDF tanks uh, through rubble because Gaza is, itself is a huge minefield. The entirety of the tunnels is a minefield now. And uh, uh, Jay, uh, the citizens, we have spoken about it, how the citizens are used as a shield. And uh, on the other hand, Ukraine, the citizens were not cared about. Uh, the civilian areas were, were bombarded haphazardly. There was no uh, looking back at what is happening. So two uh, parts, places of the world, but one where civilians were defending Hamas, one where civilians were, did not know where to go. That's their home. Ukraine was their home. So. Uh, and Russian, uh, Russian aggression is uh, something which cannot be um, justified. But the war is so, um, you know, we can debate for it, we can vouch for it because of the happening, the foresee of happening again in the future. 
So, and we want Putin to stop. So, you know, these are two things. Analysts, uh, speakers, they don't know how to uh, talk about the same the same principle cannot be implemented in both the areas. Now that's so, that's such that's an wrong. important point. You know, I yeah. I didn't think of that as I as I sketched out the discussion here today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. the media, and the media is like yes. you know the the fifth column. The media tells everybody what they think is happening and what they think people are thinking, um, mm -hmm. and as a result, the media is playing into the propaganda game, and and so you have to you have to examine how the media is doing, what it's doing, why it's doing, what forces are in play in, in structuring the stories of various media, um, you know, on networks and cable and, and for that matter, print press and, emer and emerging new media with uh, YouTube. And so, yes. you know, I suggest that uh, this has never happened to the extent we are seeing it right now, where the media is in the mix every day, reporting or giving us disinformation but definitely on the battlefield. Yes, the rise of the pseudo liberals, Jay. The people who are woke, but uh, promote the most uh, uh, heinous of atrocities. And uh, they defend uh, hijacking, they defend uh, Putin's aggression, they defend uh, civilians being killed in combat. And at the same time, I mean, uh, you see, Jay, Pseudo liberals are a very dangerous species in today's world. They'll give you a lecture of about how uh, what is happening is real, but they twist it to their turn. Uh, they will defend Putin in one place, and then they will talk about uh, Hamas being, you know, exploited, targeted, and you know, this way. But nobody will give you the right facts. You know, every point, Jay, you have to take it on the pros and cons and make a neutral decision it's always the best way to go about any news or any like you always do you have a list of uh, uh, points but all of them are at first sight they're straight and they are non-biased and that's the way media functions properly but when you have a bias you will you'll have an inclination towards uh, the the way that you are wanting to go and asymmetric warfare is all about how you play on vulnerabilities, the technology, the tactics that are planned, they are all about, uh, you know, these nitty gritties that are uh, studied. They are not about the conventional warfare where you have a head on collision. This is how I can hurt you in the maximum possible way with least effort. And, you know, the uh, media is now playing into the hands of uh, the pseudo liberals in such a sad way that each voice is appreciated, which goes the right way. Yeah, it's so interesting that this is different. When you take the, the composite of all these factors, um, including, you know, the war crimes in Bucha and, you know, Ukraine, which is still going on. Um, the mm -hmm. Russians intentionally bomb shopping centers. They intentionally mm -hmm. bomb residential properties and hospitals intentionally. And they've been doing that for the duration. Um, and there's no claim that the Ukrainian army is hiding in the hospitals. No, pregnant women are hiding in the hospitals. They bomb the hospitals and children. Um, it is it is such a contortion um, of, of any morality. And yet um, the International Court of Justice is really not doing a job. Um, they, they, haven't, uh, they haven't brought up um, those cases where Russia has engaged in war crimes. Um, it's not happening there. Um, they haven't uh, addressed, the United Nations in general hasn't addressed uh, the war crimes on October 7th, if you can even consider them war crimes. They, you know, that wasn't a war, it was an attack, it was butchery. Um, yes. And then now, now they're claiming that Israel, because it bombed uh, various places to, uh, you know, defend against the human shield technique, um, the, the, they're engaged in a war crime, and we'll see that unfold. But, you know, that's it, that's it. There are thousands of war crimes investigators in Ukraine right now, but no case is pending. Um, nothing yeah. has happened. And then, of course, let me let me offer another thought that, that really makes the war in Israel different. Tunnels you mentioned, but hostages. Host what an insidious strategy. Um, and you're right, it goes beyond the kinetic war. It, yes. it goes to propaganda. It's a psychological battle. It's an attempt to divide um, the people who you are attacking, divide them politically. 
and and hostage taking is so insidious. Your thoughts about that? Yeah, Jay, no, no, to thought about that, just a single this, that the hostages, you know, five were found killed in a tunnel, uh, two were sold. I mean, this, uh, the arrest we don't know about. You have domestic pressure on uh, Mr. Netanyahu. And this kind of hostage situation has been unprecedented in the world. This number and, you know, the possibility that it can happen on every street in the world is what makes the war against Israel, very, 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 very important in the historical perspective. Because uh, Jews, Christians, uh, Muslims, Hindus, everybody has a right of a human being. Nobody can be taken hostage on every street. And the situation is now such that uh, they were given a free hand, one day. And when, uh, you know, you have uh, South Africa, an uh, apartheid nation, accusing uh, Israel of uh, apartheid. I mean, I, I don't understand international diplomacy then <laughs> because uh, they they cannot do this. You declare Putin a war criminal, he will visit the countries which do not accept the judgment. I mean, what kind of international uh, supervision is this? Everybody has uh, a functioning with their own wars and each one is free uh, without inhibitions to continue to their goal without any restriction. I mean, if you call for international supervision, where was the univocal international condemnation after the Israel terrorist attack? You had Muslims which were pro, Muslims which were uh, some countries which were against. There was no univocal, uh, uh, revoc uh, you know, uh, repercussions for Israel. No support for Israel. Everybody should have come and said, "This is a terror attack on Israel, and we support Israel." They did not. That is the reality of today. That people uh, are changing the narrative. And uh, to bring Hamas to uh, civilian uh, killing and all that from a terrorist attack on Israel was the very force of the media, jail, very force of the newspapers, the televisions, the, uh, you know, every person on the street tearing down posters. This is the kind of thing that happens. And Ukraine, I mean, uh, you, you, you must have read the article that Zelsinski's mother-in-law was reported by Egyptian uh, she bought a villa, luxury villa in Egypt, and he was reported killed. Now, this kind of uh, reporting uh, makes us see that the funding that Zelsinski goes around for is not being used in the right places. Then yeah. there is a still towards Putin, but what Putin is doing is aggression at his purest beast mode. So, uh, Zelsinski should have been more careful with this kind of, uh, you know, this much responsibility he has for Ukraine. He is not going about his functions the way he should. Well, in a war of attrition, everything is subject to attrition. Even, yes. you know, the uh, solidarity of your own government is subject to attrition. You know, we have fights among the Israeli government. We have fights among uh, Zelensky's government. Um, and over a period of time, it it changes. Nothing is so certain as change. You know, I'm reminded of a movie called The the Tale That Wagged the Dog um, some decades ago with Dustin Hoffman. And it was a, about a completely fictitious war. Uh, it was a, a movie made of a, a completely fictitious war. Um, it was organized for political purposes. And and I think in, in part we have that. We have, uh, you know, it's it, it really amazing how the cameras get into um, you know, the uh, Palestinian uh, hospitals and streets, and, and they just seem to be there all the time. The amount of footage is extraordinary. Even the footage on October 7th is extraordinary. And it got into the hands of the Israelis, too, um, showing you incredible atrocities. So so gross that we, the public, have not have not seen it yet, but we've heard about it. We've heard what they have done to women, for example. Um, yeah. So, you know, these things, you know, I guess you could say they go back um, to the, the fifth century. Um, but but you think well, maybe maybe things weren't as bad in terms of some of these things, some of these mm, tech technol technology things as as they as could have happened in the fifth century. But what what I want to raise with you um, is that these things and we haven't covered them all. These um, atrocities and, and high-tech uh, attacks on 
civilians and these manipulations of the press, uh, these destructions of uh, agricultural agricultural uh, uh, institutions, um, the horrendous things that have happened in both places, um, these are not the end of it. These two wars will come to an end, okay? One way or the other, maybe, you know, we will like the result, maybe we won't. But the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. And we will see more wars because wars are a part of the human condition going forward. We always have wars. We always have copycats. And if somebody were making a list of the kind of items that you and I are talking about today, in both Ukraine and, and in uh, Israel and the Middle East, um, he would or she would repeat these things, would use the same tactics again in another place, another, another conflagration. Um, we are not done with these things, I'm suggesting. I'd like your view of it. We are only starting. Yeah, Jay. Uh, I mean, conventional is out of the window forever. And like you said, if, like one of the shows that we mentioned, that every civilian is now trying to equip uh, themselves with their self-defense weapons. So now a war will be fight, fought at your doorstep. The final frontier will be your doorstep. How much you can protect your own self. Earlier it would have been armies fighting with each other. And then, you know, you have surrender of uh, prisoners. This was, this was the normal uh, happening. But now hostages, you have drone technology, you have, uh, you know, trenches, you have, uh, you know, so many new elements which have come in. And drones, you know, you have October 7th. That was such a scary thing. 3,000 Hamas paragliders coming in. So these are not detected by the radar. These are not detected by the Iron Dome. This was a bending of finding a loophole in the uh, warfare. And that is the most dangerous part of this asymmetric warfare that we talk about, Jay. That uh, the enemy, when it finds itself in a lower or you know subordinate position, they try to find ways in which they can hurt the superior person with these kind of tactics. And these tactics require a lot of planning. We have already said that uh, Putin did not go in unplanned. Uh, uh, Hamas did not come in unplanned. They all expected a reaction. And uh, Putin got the reaction. And economy is playing such a big part in all this day. Putin has been selling his oil like, like it's a, a bazaar, you know. He's just, uh, whoever wants it, come and take it kind of a thing. He revolutionized the dollar system. So, uh, you know, you had, like you, you, you told about, Jay, the stocks which were sold. There is so much of uh, these elements which are involved. They were not involved in the world wars or anything. It was a simple give and take soldiers which were, uh, you know, giving, uh, defending their country. Now it's defending your civilians, defending your house, defending your uh, hostages. I mean, that has come down to that without any support of any international organization or international coalition. I mean, in Libya, the UN went in with such a forceful coalition to remove Gaddafi. But where is the resolve of action now, Jay? There is hardly any resolve. You have support for a terrorist attack. That is new to me. And that is dangerous for tomorrow because you have a refugee problem which is going to explode and, you know, kind of take down the European system. It's a threat. It's a real threat. When you see them walking in everywhere and now they're on the American shores also. So. Yeah, well, we're is... living in a transition. It's, these are transitional times. You mm -hmm. know, the old methodologies, um, you know, the, the old strategies seem to be irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> you know, for example, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, put some carriers out there in the Mediterranean. Um, and um, th there was some, and they left already. Uh, but there was some suggestion that they were exposed, and that there were weapons, uh, for, you know, in the hands of people maybe who get weapons from Iran or North Korea or Russia, um, that could m make a, a very effective attack on a carrier. Um, so you know, the old methodologies, the old equipment, the old strategies, I think, are being tested. 
Iron Dome is a good example. Um, they mm -hmm. found out they were smart. They were, as you said, they were planning this for a while. They found out if they shot a lot of rockets all at the same time, Iron Dome mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to handle, you know, mm -hmm. the number the number of rockets coming at Israel. So you know, you know Iron Dome has to be upgraded, um, or Iron Dome is simply over the hill, so to speak. It's no longer effective against someone who understands that that rule of firing a lot of a lot of rockets and you know um the whole notion this goes back forever about white flags you know you oh, carry yeah. a white flag um and you also have um, martyrdom bombs attached to you explosives so you you march with your white flag into a group of israeli troops and you blow yourself up uh, all of a sudden white flags are not what they used to be um, children, not what they used to be. Imagine a, a weapon in the child's bed, uh, a, a tunnel access under the child's bed in the child's room. Um, that didn't happen before. It, you know, it seems terribly immoral. And what it is, is a test of um, those who would be completely immoral and do outrageous things against those who are playing the game as it used to be played. So the game, the game is changing. And I suggest, as I said before, we've been discussing um, that these things are not temporary. We will see them again, and we will we will also see this whole notion of outrageous conduct, immoral conduct. We will see that as as a mindset. Um, and as you said, you know, a small a nation that that has um, you know uh, agents from larger, more weaponized nations like Iran. Um, those nations will have the technology, and with that mindset, they'll do anything. They'll do asymmetric things. They'll do high-tech things. They'll do very clever, deceptive things against against the population in general. Um, I, I I hate to think of it, but this is going to happen again and again. And, and worse worse than that, this mindset will allow for all kinds of new, very quote clever strategies and devices uh, in the future. So it's not just what we learn on these two war fronts. It's thing, other things that will be generated um, uh, out, of, out of that kind of outrageous conduct in, uh, that we haven't thought of yet, that nobody's thought of yet. We're into creative wars, are we not? True, Jay. Who ever thought of suicide drones? Uh, Iran is making uh, millions out of selling Shaheen drones, they are suicide drones that we discussed about when we were discussing uh, warfare. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine opened up markets for is Iran under sanction. They got $100 billion. What did they use it for? Funding Hezbollah. Uh, so this kind of uh, consequential uh, reactions that uh, impact that the Ukraine war had on Israel-Hamas war is... Uh, is phenomenal, Jay. Nobody ever thought every war was fought in territory. It was never fought, fought across the system. Now, this, every war is affecting geostrategic uh, considerations are so huge in this. The Islamic nations do not want uh, Israel-Saudi friendship. That would ruin the entire uh, dynamics of the Middle East. Uh, this is geopolitics, which is very, very uh, sensitive, Jay. And to bring Israel and uh, Saudi at the table, you have had two presidents, Trump and Biden, who have worked hard for it. And when it was going to culminate into, you know, uh, it got speed at the G20, this is what happens. Uh, there is a, the Islamic nations do not see Israel as a friend with Saudi. One of the biggest, strongest allies has to be away from Israel. And uh, this this terrorist attack was a good test to see how much Saudi came out in defense. If it was not like before, who could have imagined Saudi will not come out and condemn, uh, you know? It was, uh, it was uh, shocking to see how Saudi was taking a very muted stand, not such a vibrant, you know, uh, pro-Islamic stand. They were muted because a lot of economic considerations are coming. This, you know, this whole of... thing about uh, asymmetric is really interesting yeah. because it, if, for example, the United States would be an ally for Ukraine or Israel, um, then mm -hmm. what you do in an asymmetric war is you try to attack 
the willpower, the political will of the United States. And and maybe you generate some some um, you know protests on college campuses. Um, maybe you uh, encourage uh, legislators who might oppose um, support for Israel or Ukraine. And so what you do is you undermine um, the leadership of countries that that might help. And so that's part of the war. Part of the yes. war is scaring ships in Aden yes. and at attacking anybody in the Red Sea. Um, you, you're, what you're doing is you're destroying or you know undermining world commerce. You're making mm. such a, a problem for the whole world. So the whole world has to pay attention to you. And how does a big ship in, in the Red Sea deal with uh, terrorists? who are firing from undisclosed locations, who come with small boats and, and, and helicopters and the like and take over your ship. All these things, they're very new, very creative. And, um, and finally, um, you know, I, I, I suggest that uh, um, we have um, a proliferation of multi-front wars. From, from going forward, uh, wars may not be one country on another. Uh, a war now um, involves everybody who has any interest, uh, political interest, support interest, uh, weapons productions interest. Uh, you know, and I would I would call that a world war because so yes. many countries are involved. If you count the number of countries that are involved uh, in Ukraine mm -hmm. and in Israel, you know, it's like the whole world. Rukmani, oh, this is a world war, isn't it? True, 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 true. So right, so right about this, Jay. You can't go wrong with your analysis ever. Uh, they're they're hurting democracy. They're hurt. You know the Houthi rebels that you spoke about just now. They wanted to take revenge on Israel, but Israel is too far away, so they decided to go for the ships. I mean, how crazy can it get? So uh, they have these. Uh, underlying uh, uh what do you call it fire to fight the war but they don't know what to do so they will do it in their own little way on college campus uh in the sea they become pirates you know these small things they try to hurt democracy uh now as you know new york is a sanctuary uh place means everybody gets shelter now refugees are using this uh in the wrong way but those refugees are going to come back and join the war when they get stronger. So uh, kind of uh, vulnerabilities have increased to such an extent that they're spread amongst us. Jay. You don't know uh, where the point to trust is. Yeah, and, and you can have a situation. You can have a situation like in the United Nations. It's, it's, it's weak. It's vulnerable because of the Security Council problem. It's never going to be able to do anything. I'm sorry, never. The United yeah, Nations is over the hill, uh, and it can't come back. Um, in fact, the uh, EU is over the hill in the sense that um, Viktor Orban in Hungary was able to block an EU uh, initiative to provide funding um, for for Ukraine. He stopped it, uh, tens of billions. Um, and so, you know, what you have is you have weaknesses in institutional structures, and. You're on one side of this asymmetric war. You look for those weaknesses and you attack those structures. And then what you get is chaos. And that's what we have now. There is no global leadership, not ours, not the UN. Who then? And, and the world divides in two parts. The ones who want to bring the United States down, it's already on a decline in my opinion. Uh, and those who want to, you know, support these immoral wars, um, which is Russia, China, uh, and a number of others. Uh, yes. and of course, in the Middle Eastern countries who are, you know, devoted to killing Jews, no matter what the circumstances. And yes. so all in all, the world is dividing. It's, it's cleaving into two parts, uh, those who stand for some kind of morality and those who don't. And they're, they're, all taking active shots at the other side. Um, I'm, I'm not optimistic. Are you optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> we are not optimistic, but we analyze well, Jay. 
so but uh, this kind of uh, um two two parts that are happening right now jay it's so uh, deplorable don't you think jay like uh, earlier it would be i'm fighting for my country now it is i don't know what i'm fighting for, but i'm fighting it is <laughs> exactly like that they're fighting for commerce they're fighting for country they're fighting against the jews they're fighting for religion uh, i mean there is no set convention and international organizations which were supposed to be maintainers and implementers there is they refuse to put the word hamas inside so what can you expect from them so i mean it's now i don't expect anything of international supervision but the wars have become so uh, multifaceted or you know confused when you don't know the aim and objective of the war you don't know what you're fighting for well, if you, if you take my thought from a, a minute ago, namely that the world is cleaving into two parts, those who would like the United States to you know, decline and, and the others, um, it seems to me that um, this has a recipe for a continuing war. It's just that the venue might change. Uh, the venue might change from this location to another location, but it, it's the same forces at play doing the same things and using all that clever technology and strategy that we have seen emerging over the past couple of years. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's, you know, I, I was thinking before that, oh, this will pop up again. Well, it, it just may continue. And the only thing that changes is the location. What do you think? <laughs> so, so true, Jay. I mean, I can bring you down to the location that a person on a mobile phone when they tweet against Israel, they feel, wow, we have done something to support Hamas. That is the level that it has come down to, or a single tweet or a single you know, uh, post on your Instagram or your WhatsApp will make you feel, wow, I'm fighting this kind of war. That kind of zeal, and uh, I use it often, jingoism that is going on in people's heart is uh, very uh, surprising. I mean, there's a war happening in Ukraine and Russia, and you are... Uh, you don't want to analyze it straight. You want to make it a mess. There's a terrorist attack on Israel. You want to make it a war in Israel just by typing and, you know, signing petitions. There is one clip where they make you sign the petition and when they give you the terms and conditions, like, you know, that they will, um, Hamas regime, the Palestine regime is so anti-LGBT, uh, uh, so anti-homosexuality. But you will have homosexuals on the streets fighting for them. They'll be thrown off a roof in Saudi if they go over there. But they don't, or in Hamas, but they don't, they don't have the brains or rational to think what are they supporting. I mean, you have to have a rational behind every single support. They don't have that, Jay. And so they feel, yes, they can do it. They can do it. They're on the yeah. war front on every mobile, Jay. Well, I think what it tells us is that uh, these these various, um, you know, animosities and uh, strategies, negative strategies, and and destructive, um, um, destructive processes, um, are not going to stop. They're they're out there. As I said, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, and you cannot put the genie back in the bottle, and you cannot stop them. And everything that we've talked about here today is is going to continue in one way or the other. And, and the common denominator for all of these things that they are, they are an undermine of, of civil liberties and civil rights. They are an undermine of morality, kindness, caring for the human condition. Uh, they lead to destruction of democratic institutions, of all institutions. Um, they lead to continuing violence uh, against everyone. There's no exceptions. And um, you know, and, and and continuing chaos, they take us into all of us into chaos, and 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 all the while, this is so biblical. All the while, climate change inexorably oh. marches on while nobody pays attention to it. Um, how much of that do you agree with, and where do you think we're going? Hundred percent, ten percent. I agree with you, Jay. Uh asymmetric is symmetrically talking about climate change the warriors of climate change are now supporting uh hamas they are uh, talking of israel hamas ukraine russia they've forgotten the agenda they're forgotten the funding 
you know, uh, the COP26, 28, which happened, you know, you had to have a lot of uh, things which had to be discussed. And like you said, uh, the wars need to be resolved in order to get commerce back on track, green revolution back on track, so that you can do something better for the world. The world is deteriorating any which ways through climate change. But uh, these wars are just affecting the uh, diversion of funds towards these uh, this climate change. And Jay, uh, one more point I want to make that, you know, when you saw the hostage taking, I mean, it's important. We have so much technology. We have the Iron Dome, everything. But it was like a 1930s movie where they were picking up hostages on a motorcycle. And you couldn't do anything about it but watch on television. So yeah, we, that we see it all. Hitlessness that comes in asymmetrical warfare is also one of the main points that are very, very uh, disturbing for vulnerabilities. Very disturbing, and I don't, I don't know if we know the whole of it. You know, we talked today, Rupati, about asymmetric war. We have examples. We have things that do come to our attention. We have things that are reported to us in the media. But there are other things. I mean, for example, um, in the week before October 20, uh, October 7th, there were huge short sales in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, with insider information, knowing there was going to be a massacre on October 7th, and they made a ton of money. <clears throat> and, yes. you know, we never heard any more about it since then. But I suggest to you that later on, we'll find out more. We'll find out more of these very, very clever techniques. Well, thank you, Rupmati. It's been, it's great to talk to you, to, uh, you know, circle back with you. And I look forward to more discussions uh, in a few days. Thank you so much. Hello, Ajay. It's always precious to be with you.